and her main research interest is in immigrant community life. She's the author of the award-winning book, Clubbing Together, which examines the associational culture of Scots in the diaspora and has since published more comparative work focused on the English diaspora as well. In her current research, Tanya examines the role of immigrant associations in shaping the collective actions and identity of Europeans in the UK, um, taking a longitudinal perspective from circa 1850 until the present. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tanya's talk today, which is Migration Nation, Perspectives on the Role of Migration in the Making of Scottish Society um, since around 1800. Thank you very much, Tanya. Thank you very much, Claire, for that uh, introduction, very kind. And thank you also for the invitation to give a paper at this conference today. It's my uh, pleasure to be at your annual conference and to start us off with um, the discussions about, well, there and back again, various aspects of, of migration. And I suppose my talk today serves a number of purposes. I was hoping perhaps to provide a little bit of context really to some of the other discussions, which I think will be more specific in nature um, than perhaps some of the points I make, which are maybe broader around patterns of movements of people and the wider issues to do with how migration has shaped Scottish society more broadly and actually that brings me to one point I wanted to make at the beginning the way I define this in my paper today is really broadly as kind of a global Scotland really in a sense and I come back to that at the end of my presentation so we can perhaps discuss this in that context also what what is Scotland in a sense who is Scottish um, you know, with all the movements that are going on, I think there are lots of questions now, perhaps especially post Brexit as well, kind of a bit more up to date. So I'm going to do a Prezi presentation, which I'm going to share with you in a second. But some of you, based on my old experience, might find it easier to look at this directly. So I put a link in the chat so you could also open it there. That should hopefully work. But I will sh uh, share my screen now. Okay. So basically, as I said, what I want to do is to provide a kind of introduction in a sense to some of the various aspects in which migration has shaped Scottish society. And I want to do that through the window of one story essentially in particular. But let me start with some broader considerations really to do also with numbers and demographics that relate to the movement of Scots abroad, but also people into Scotland. I will do that at the end uh, though. So let's talk about the outward flows in the first instance, or rather the flows internally within Scotland actually as well, because one of the things we should also consider for our question in terms of how migration has shaped Scottish society is how people have moved within Scotland. And there are different reasons for that, partly because it tells us a lot about the makeup of Scottish society, about things like industrialization, growing urbanization in the 19th century. I've chosen two pictures here to kind of contrast this one from the kelp industry, an Orkney kelp burning picture here from the 1880s, which gives you an idea very much of this rough and ready life. Um, also an industry that was massively uh, beginning to become less relevant in decline in, in these areas. But if you look actually in the background of the image, you can also see some crofts and some old kind of buildings that are not intact anymore. So just the, about the life in these locations, obviously you get a glimpse of what it was like. Contrasting this with a picture from the Clyde shipyards um, as just one example of the types of industries that were developing. This is a later picture, but I just uh, quite liked it. So I wanted to share it. But obviously ever since industrialization also began to develop in the UK, generally and in Scotland in some centers specifically, people were being attracted to these new urban centers like Glasgow um, and other cities that were developing in Scotland itself. And that obviously attracted people from the highlands and islands to these places. And this internal migration is really important to understand for that reason alone, because it impacted population patterns and so on. But also quite a few of these immigrants who made their way from the highlands to cities in the lowlands, later on also perhaps moved further afield to destinations overseas. For quite a few, this was sort of a step migration in many respects. So it's also really relevant to understand it for that reason as a second point. 
Then we also should consider, I think, what is often described as the near diaspora. So that's a location that's no longer kind of Scotland, really, but close by. So that includes England and it includes certainly also continental Europe, where there have been a lot of movements for a long time over centuries prior to the main period of my paper today from sort of 1800. But in particular, London has long since been a destination, certainly for a lot of um, more middle class Scots as a stepping stone for other ventures or adventures. Um, but many of them also stayed there. And I've given you some figures there about the birthplace of the population of London once we have censuses that tell us a little bit more about that contrasting Scotland and England. So you can really see that there was quite a significant proportion of Scots going to Scotland. And as I say, there had been previous as well, previous to these periods as well. And I've added here a picture of the Scottish Corporation or some drawing really from a newspaper. And the Scottish Corporation was one of the many, many, many Scottish associations that were set up all around the world. I'll mention a few others later on that remained very much a hub for Scots who'd moved to whatever location we're talking about, London in this instance, bringing these Scots together for different reasons, certainly social sort of networking or just general more sort of business networking were reasons why often these Scots came together in these clubs and associations. But there was also often a sort of philanthropic aspect to help fellow Scots who perhaps had fallen on bad times. And that was certainly the case for the Scottish Corporation and the Scottish Hospital. They were sort of one organization really who were helping Scots in London. And they were all born out of a much earlier development in the 17th century of the so-called Scots box which was essentially that a box in which money was made available for poorer Scots in the city at the time. So again, you see how these migrants form these kinds of organizations to remain connected. But London was of course only one center. Ultimately, Scots were spread all around England in different locations. And you can see some other figures there generally over um, the period of time, not just for England and Wales, but also Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, Ulster Scots is, I'm sure, a term you might be familiar with. So, of course, there are other movements in this near diaspora as well. In England, specifically, other major centres that Scots ended up moving to, for instance, the area around Newcastle. I used to live in Newcastle, so I know even now there are some traces quite visible in some parts of Newcastle. Of course, Scots often came there for, for shipbuilding, to work on the shipyards. But again, these kinds of clubs, like in London, were being set up. So they're also cultural markers that Scots have left in this very close to Scotland, sort of near diaspora. And similar patterns can be found for continental Europe. But then, of course, many also moved further afield. And that sort of brings me to the little image, sorry, painting that you might have saw earlier on already, which is a painting entitled The Emigrants by William Ellsworth. And it is showing this Scottish family that's about to emigrate to New Zealand. And they're all clad in traditional Scottish kind of Highland costume, tartan, and so on. And they have this painted perhaps as a way to remember their old home. But as you can see from the figures there, there's a significant increase over time in the migration movements outward away from Scotland. And numbers are really significant. Now, estimates vary a little bit, but roughly speaking, from what we sometimes refer to as the age of mass migration, because so many people from all over Europe left their places uh, of where they were born to move overseas from roughly the middle of the 19th century onwards in particular, nearly 2 million Scots left Scotland. So it's a very significant, uh, in terms of net out migration, uh, figure. And in terms of their destinations, there's also, uh, you can clearly see that it spreads across different areas more and more. So this depends, of course, a little bit on other developments. So for example, New Zealand was discovered much later. So naturally by default, the migration to New Zealand could only occur much later than to say the um, uh, North American continent. <laughs> 
where, you know, certainly in the US, there had been Scots from very early on, even prior to the Revolutionary Wars, for instance. So that's before the main period for which we have figures uh, shown here. But these destinations diversified and generally speaking, Scots moved to all of them in significant numbers, especially if you think about it in terms also of their population share at home. So whereas Scots, in terms of the UK, made up around 12% perhaps of the population round about this time. In New Zealand, for instance, they made up around 25% um, by the 1870s. So you can see they were overrepresented in some of these migrant cohorts around the world. And that is also an interesting question, perhaps in terms of some of their legacies that we might wish to consider in how they shape not just Scotland, but also these places around the world. But as I said, I really would like to look at these questions now through one particular story, and it's the story of John Jack. And if you've heard any of my talks before, you've probably heard his name before, because he's my favorite Scott, really, in terms of my research. And you'll know why by the end of this talk, because the talk basically sort of illustrates why. He shows, in some respects, all of these aspects of migration that I want to talk about today in his own sort of journey in his his biography essentially so john jack uh, comes originally from dundee and here's another picture um, with him and his family but he also actually moved internally within Scotland. So he was a migration first uh, in a sort of stepped way, as I said before, and as an example of that, they moved from Dundee to Edinburgh. And this is obviously a more recent photograph, but this uh, is from the family album. That was their house uh, that you can see there in, in Edinburgh, where the family moved to in the 1870s for business opportunities, for taking up different jobs. So exactly the sort of reasons that would always make people move like the people I referred to previously. So the family moved from Dundee uh, to Edinburgh, but they clearly weren't quite content. So they continued their journey and they moved or decided to move from Edinburgh to New Zealand. Now that's of course, 1870s, 1880s, when they were thinking about this, a destination that really was still very far away. Even in those days, it still took around three months to get from Scotland or from the UK to New Zealand, which was an improvement already to the early days when it could sometimes uh, take close to six months. But still, it was the you know furthest away you could sort of get. But the Jack family made the decision to leave and they moved from Edinburgh, well, in, in steps and small steps first to the harbour of Leith, and here's just an old painting of the harbour. But you can also see here a record from John Jack's journal. And this is one reason why I like him so very much, because there are records of all the steps that he sort of makes on his migration journey. So he writes there, we left 48 Lauder Road, Edinburgh, in the evening of Saturday 27th of October 1883 at eight o'clock, took a cab to Leith Harbour and then wanted to take the SS Iona, it says there, to go to London in the first instance. Now that was something that a lot of Scottish um, emigrants had to do, to go to an English port in the first instance uh, where most of the ships were leaving from. It was rare um, and not many examples of Scottish uh, ports being used directly for departures, although there are some. But anyway, they went uh, to London and um, were waiting for the SS uh, Iona to leave. It also then makes reference to friends that had come to the harbour uh, and had brought, you know, a cake and presents and all sorts of things. It goes on a little bit to describe that in more detail in this journal, journal. and then also describes the departure from London in more detail where they left from the East India dock and away we went, it says later on in the journal. So this was their first step and they traveled from London on the Invercargill. And here is a painting of that ship a few years later, the Jacks left London in 1883 and this painting is from 1887. Um, so they went on this ship and you can imagine living on this ship for three months at a time, that's quite an experience to have. But again, the journal captures all of this. Now the Jacks were cabin passengers, so they had a relatively more comfortable journey than many other people would have had at this point in time. 
They account of the people they met. They were particularly uh, happy to meet fellow Scots on this journey, which perhaps again tells you something about the importance of shared roots. If you're a migrant, you're often looking for something to use as a starting point for conversations. Perhaps that was it. But they also made some connections that then turned out to be really useful for them once they had arrived in Wellington. That's where they were going to. And this is a photograph of Wellington in the 1880s, probably mid 1880s. So shortly after the Jacks had arrived in the city. And you can see that indeed it does already look quite a bit like a city. There's another sailing vessel anchored in the harbor. And the interesting thing of this photograph is also that it's pretty much from where the Jacks then ended up living. Um, they lived close to uh, this particular cemetery, um, a Catholic cemetery in Wellington and the house was just down the road from there. So they pretty much had this perspective once they had moved in there. But they found their house thanks to that other passenger on the Invercargill who they met uh, on their journey. So this was an interesting example of, yeah, well, I suppose the immediate benefits of these kinds of connections that the Jacks had forged on that trip. And they kept also writing letters back to their family as much as was possible during the journey. Um, and then, of course, also from Wellington, which is why we know how also their story was often shared in Dundee with other people back in Scotland. So in this sense, the Jacks really are one of the examples in which news from immigrants traveled back to Scotland in these personal testimonies. Or if you wanted a very different example, you may have heard of David Livingston or Mary Slessor and the magic lantern slides that were being used often to tell the stories of this heroic missionaries from Scotland. So these stories of Scots overseas were being told in Scotland in many different ways. And they did actually really shape some discussions back home in Scotland, even if on a smaller level. But for the Jacks, we certainly know how in Dundee, some of the family members and neighbors talked about their adventure to New Zealand. But of course, once they were there, they then had to think about how to actually make home in this new world. And of course, that had to do with some of the desires they had, but they didn't actually initially know whether they were going to stay in Wellington, but they, they did, perhaps partly because of the encounter they had had um, on ship, which helped them find lodgings. But they also then set up a business, specifically John with his son, as wine merchants in Featherson Street in Wellington. And you have a photograph here from the 1890s when their business was still in operation. Unfortunately, there isn't an actual photograph of that, but this at least give you, gives you some idea. So the buildings are already fairly grand. The street perhaps less so, well, grand maybe, but certainly still quite uh, muddy, it looks like. So there was still an element, even in Wellington, of a sort of more rough and ready life, but it, it was certainly a city. We have more evidence of what the Jacks then did from the Cyclopedia of New Zealand, um, which is from a, a sort of from the early 19th century, an account of prominent people in New Zealand based on provinces and large cities. It says there, Mr. Jack Senior has had a large experience in connection with the trade, wine merchant. Mr. Jack Junior was brought up to the trade as well, a whole CT merchant and was connected with the well-known firm of James McLaren and son of London and Edinburgh. So you can also see these types of trading connections shaping relationships with Scots around the world. They are agents, Jack and son, in Wellington for Douglas Gordon and Company Aberdeen and the Talisca Distillery Company of Sky. So they obviously were um, dealing with, with quite a bit of peaty whiskey there, I assume. So this was how they began to settle in and they became members quite significantly though also of the community. And in that sense, John Jack is very much another archetypal Scot because he was networking widely and very much part of the associational life of Scots in Wellington. They were often, as uh, my book notes, clubbing together. And John Jack was a member of the Wellington Caledonian Society. That was one of the many, many, many um, such ethnic associations like the Scottish Corporation in London that were set up by these Scottish migrants all around the world. 
And this is only one example. Now, this photograph is from around 1900 of the Wellington Caledonian Society. John Jack, I think, is not on it. Um, that's going just by looking at the faces. Um, there's unfortunately no detailed description. But what you can see here is this group standing at the um, stand, at a sort of concert stand at the Basin Reserve in Wellington, which is really a sporting ground. And they were standing there because um, Wellington, like lots of other centres in New Zealand, were hosting Caledonian Games. That's the name they used, essentially Highland Games. So caber tossing, you know, kilt wearing, hammer throwing Scots and many others, uh, New Zealanders, um, were partaking in this during usually the Christmas and New Year holiday period, because this was obviously reverse seasons in New Zealand, so it was a good time to hold these games. And they were one reason why Hogmanay was also really quite a big thing in New Zealand, because it was the time of all these Scottish games. Don't know that much about John Jack's involvement in the society, other than that he was a member, but he was certainly networking in that group, like so many other Scots around the world, using these groups again as a means to kind of, yeah, celebrate their shared roots, have some haggis at different celebrations and so on. But in New Zealand, like elsewhere, well, in New Zealand, the games, elsewhere, some other activities as well, they were very much serving a wider community function, not just a Scottish community function. So in terms of Scots shaping different societies, it's important to also consider these activities because they weren't just about memories of Scotland. They were really also about integrating into these new communities and, and making these new communities. So as I say, in New Zealand, particularly through the game, so it was really the shaping of sporting culture in New Zealand that was so significantly shaped by these groups. But John Jack was also, as you can see there, a member of the Wellington Harbour Board. And one of the two gentlemen who sit in the interests of the ratepayers of Wellington City, which gives an, you some idea of how widely known he was, partly because of that, lots of people always wanted to talk to him to discuss different issues their trade or their area of Wellington was faced with. So he was, as I say, a well-known Scot in the city, like many others. He is also an example, though, of a very connected world in which, though, we must perhaps ask the question, where is home? And this is something that I find particularly interested and maybe we interesting, sorry, and maybe we can discuss this later on in a little bit more detail. We talk a lot about migration. But, you know, what are the reference points of all these people? And that's not a historic question. That's for all of us. I'm a migrant myself. Where is my home? I sometimes wonder about that. But the reason why, again, John Jack is so interesting is because he essentially went full circle. So remember that he left Dundee to move to Edinburgh, to move to New Zealand. Well, initially, when I found John Jack, I thought, I would never find any records of him because his name is a name that's kind of like a horror for a historian, John Jack, which way around, both kind of first names, potentially tricky name. The reason he was so easy to find was because he was the first person to be cremated in New Zealand. And that's because he wanted his ashes to be sent back to the family vault in Dundee. And as it says there in the newspaper uh, account, this will be, as I said, the first cremation in Wellington, but actually in New Zealand. But if you look also at the other article, which is a little bit longer, um, it makes reference to the funeral in Karori, that's a part of Wellington. And it was a largely attended event, perhaps again, reflecting the sort of status he had in the city, as we've learned. Um, and it says, in accordance with Scottish custom, the first part of the ceremony took place at the house where the deceased had resided, and then the cremation took place. We now commit the body to the flames, the symbol of purification and ardour, so you find all the kind of religious elements that would be normally part of, of a funeral, but in this case, the cremation. And it gives you a bit of a description of the actual um, cremation itself. Um, and there were quite a few accounts of this in all New Zealand newspapers, again, because it was the first. But the cremation was the method by which the late Mr. Jack desired his remains to be disposed of, and his wish was accordingly uh, fulfilled by his sons. The ashes, as previously stated, so making reference to the other report, will be forwarded to Dundee for internment in the family vault in that city. 
Now, meanwhile, in Dundee, there had also been um, an announcement of John Jack's death in the local papers. Again, remember, there was a strong connection and flow of information through these personal family letters with the family still resident in Dundee. And then indeed the ashes were sent back and they did go into the family wall. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of any of that. So this is just an image of Dundee. But the reason we know of all of this is because there are letters going back to New Zealand describing exactly what happened. So in the first instance, once the ashes had arrived in Dundee, they were placed on a table in the family home. And then eventually they were placed into the family vault. So a fascinating story, as I say, of so many aspects of Scottish migration, uh, this personal story, but also migration more broadly in terms of the connectedness of this world. And that's perhaps not something we often think about. John Jack's little story shaped some of the perceptions of migration, certainly in his family, but also some wider community in Dundee, as is clearly evidenced. And this is just one example of these ongoing links that happened. But of course, my sort of starting point was Scotland as a migration nation. And for that, obviously, we can't just look at the outward movements, but also need to consider people coming to Scotland, you know, people like me in the more present times. But really, there is a long history of this, of course, um, already way before me. And I just wanted to give you some examples here particularly from the mid to late 19th century onwards, we find the movement of different types of continental Europeans. And of course, I'm sure you'll be more familiar with that. People from Ireland making that near diaspora journey for them moving to Scotland. And of course, particularly those connections are very deep and significant. And there are a lot of uh, things that I'm sure you may already have heard about the impact of, of Irish communities and also Scottish communities in Ireland, especially in centers like Glasgow. But this was also the time when more Eastern Europeans, for instance, arrived. So this here is a little um, kind of notice that was prepared for Lithuanians. There was a Lithuanian Information Bureau of Great Britain, which was established in 1902, but had here an office, um, for instance, where people could go to and get advice or could have uh, things translated, um, papers or information or whatever. So again, this was very similar to what Scots experienced abroad, you know, Lithuanians helping each other in this new environment, very similar patterns, no matter what the emigrant group, no matter what the destination. But you also have here a photograph um, of um, a confectionery and refreshment saloon, which was owned by Italians who were also beginning to come to Scotland in larger numbers around about this time. Now, they also seem to be selling Bovril. I'm not so sure about that, but there were also a growing number of ice cream stores. For instance, it does actually make um, reference to ice creams here on that window on the right, the way we're looking at it as, as well. Um, and so uh, on, on the kind of, well, wall painting, I suppose it is on, on the other side. So more and more of this was beginning to shape uh, things at home as well. So around about 1900, you had both so many of these accounts of Scots abroad and also here at home, immigrants shaping communities. Of course, many of them, like the Lithuanians, for instance, or Polish um, uh, Europeans as well, were coming for particular industries. So again, you're finding the very similar sort of pool factors that attracted, for instance, Scots to the shipyards in Newcastle, attracting you know, some of these people to places in Scotland. So the question then is in this context, and I think especially now, as I said, perhaps post Brexit, whether we're looking at a kind of global Scotland already as this migration nation shaped so profoundly both by outward movements and inward movements. But then also, I think there's now the bigger question, and this is, I think, where maybe it enters sort of a bit of a political discussion as well. To what extent this can now remain the case? Because, of course, now the issue is that post Brexit, Scotland's kind of tied in with the UK immigration policies because they're not devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So there are a lot of questions in terms of who can now come to Scotland still. So in terms of, you know, Scotland's needs, but also how Scotland can continue to be shaped 
by its migrant communities, I think there are now quite a lot of questions that are also really interesting if you look at the historical legacy in a more longitudinal perspective, and now, you know, wonder how this can move forward into the future. But of course, I'm a historian rather than someone who predicts the future, so I better um, leave it at that, but um, I'd be very delighted uh, to answer any questions you may have now. And then we can, of course, also discuss further um, later on. But I think that that I will stop sharing as that's probably better. That was a, a great talk, Tani. Thank you very much. Um, you know, very clearly structured and, and insightful. And I, I love the use of the, the case study there to, to illustrate some of the, the points you were making with the case of John Jett. Um, so, uh, the floor is open to questions. I, I can see we have one that's come through um, on the chat here, but if anybody else would like to put a question in at the moment for Tanya through the Q&A facility or the chat, now is a, a great moment to do that. Um, so I'll open with a question here from uh, Bill Patterson. Um, was New Zealand connected to Europe by undersea telegraph? And if so, when? Oh, uh, <laughs> no, there was Stepstone basically, right? Through, yeah, through, the, the, not not really, you know, you, you don't have the ships transporting letters primarily. So if you think about in terms of the connections, how long it would take for news to travel quite a while before that was fully instituted uh, via other routes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I can take chair's privilege to ask the question myself. Um, we often tend to think of emigrant associational culture as, as being something that's predominantly national or ethnic. Um, but the question I had is, do we see um, other linkages like religion or occupation being something that immigrants use to socialize in new communities? Religion, definitely. So, I mean, that's, I think, the most obvious one, you know, the Presbyterian Church, but pick any other immigrant group, it'll be similar there, was obviously a hub for a lot of people, especially also for, for many women. I mean, one of the big problems in, in my previous work, certainly, and John Jack, Jack is almost also illustrating this, because, of course, it's, it's a man, you know, it's hard to find some of these women. And so, for example, churches might be one way in which we could actually try and capture them better and how they maybe work, network together. But but it's tricky but certainly and in businesses it was often overlapping so again some of these ethnic associations Caledonian societies and Andrew societies and so on often also served to facilitate business networks that then translated into all sorts of operations and of course there are family and wider kinship networks as well that serve these functions um, in one of my studies, I'm looking at a small settlement in New Zealand, for instance, that really brings out the interconnections, partly because it's a bit easier maybe in a small settlement, but it all cuts across all of these organizations, basically. So think of it, all of it really, as a sort of Facebook before Facebook, in a sense. Um, the means in which you could network, obviously, in those days were more limited in, in that sense, because there wasn't a Twitter or there wasn't a LinkedIn to connect people. So whatever you had, you would use for those purposes. That's great, thank you. Uh, fascinating. I'm gonna have to read some of your, more of your work after hearing the lecture today. Um, I see we've got a question that's uh, come through, well, on chat, but also uh, we've got something on the Q&A as well. Um, this is from, from Colleen Beatty. Um, she says, one thing which has always struck me as interesting is the fact that each family heading to New Zealand took with them family Bibles now held in the no National Archives. Uh, religion was transmitted as, as a ready-made network. So I don't know if you'd like to add a comment to that, Tanya. Yeah, again, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. And there are other examples of, of similar items that people took, uh, uh, some, some sort of recipe books and things like that. So obviously that doesn't serve this network function, but there's almost quite a standardized packing list in some respects. But again, I think obviously religion was important to many people. So just to come back to the Jack family one more time, they actually had kind of what is probably best described as reference letters or letters of good conduct. As you may recall from my paper, they didn't necessarily intend to stay in Wellington. It just kind of happened like that. Um, but they had these letters to basically kind of as they were looking around New Zealand, which was the original plan, they, they might need them to sort of show to people, actually, I have a good character, I'm a good person. And many of them came from their local reverend, for instance. So again, obviously, the, the kind of 
church as an institution plays a role there, but it probably is a similar sort of function there as well to draw on the network that they were expecting to find through churches and through people who found sort of connections and meaning in, in, in churches. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. We've, we've got uh, some questions that have come through the, the Q&A as well. So um, first one, one from Helen. Um, you mentioned the seasons in New Zealand being reversed and that this suited newcomers well. Were there other aspects of the seasonal reversal that suited them or other aspects of New Zealand's geography, et cetera, that offered chances to enhance their customs? Um, well, I think I'm, I'm not sure it, it sort of suited them. That's not I just mentioned that they were reversed. And so it suited having the games um, at that time. Um, so that's more the point that obviously you wouldn't want to have Caledonian games perhaps in the middle of winter, which in some parts of New Zealand really did mean that snowfall and, and really cold weather. It's not quite as warm as people often uh, think. But obviously in the first instance, uh, migrants just had to get used to that. And I know this myself because I did my PhD in New Zealand. So I lived there for three years. And so, you know, it was weird. It was just strange in the first instance to have, have it all the other way around, particularly because you have these associated customs. So of course, Christmas is strange to have at the summertime. So I suppose the responses, and there's a study on this by Ali Clark on holiday culture in New Zealand, that immigrants are not just Scots, but they were trying to kind of instill that with a tradition that would work for them in this reverse season. So the Scots in that sense, maybe actually had a really good way of integrating their games into that. And because Hogmanay already has more meaning in a way than Christmas, in Scotland as well, that was a really good, as I say, hook for these activities and perhaps explains partly why they became so popular because in summer, you know, to be able to go out and, and watch these athletes compete or to actually participate yourself was, you know, an interesting activity. So in other terms, what's really interesting is that there's regular reference in some of the personal testimonies that I've looked at to landscape looking familiar. So that's not quite what the question was, but I think that was a first step just in integrating into the country. So particularly uh, some parts in Otago where a lot of Scots did settle, um, there are frequent references to it looking like the Highlands or looking like place such and such. So I think immigrants are always trying to find this meaning in places and that includes the landscape. Um, whether it always really looks like that, I don't know, but I think there's certainly some, some parts where you could see that. But then just to say for sort of a complete complete a picture, I think the point is, of course, also that much of that landscape was rough and ready still in a place like New Zealand when the earliest settlers arrived. So that was, of course, also a challenge. So we shouldn't just say um, this is something that was an opportunity. You know, you had to clear bush. Uh, some settlements failed because they were chosen in locations that just didn't work. Um, and there's, that's not just a New Zealand thing. Gail might be having some examples from Canada later on as well, but it certainly happened there too. So it's it's sort of a mixed bag in that sense. Great, we're, we're getting a small flood of more questions here. So hopefully we'll, we'll fit in um, as many as we can before 10 to. And the next question is, uh, were there subsets within the Scottish society? So did Gaelic speakers keep their own um, sex or did they subsume into the more Scottish societies, for example? Yeah, there certainly were different types of societies across the board. So I've just mentioned one now, and it's a complex picture around the world. They're not all the same at all. Um, also, what they did differed. But um, let's just stick with New Zealand as an example now, because we've already talked about it. So it makes maybe sense. So there were certainly Gaelic clubs in New Zealand, and they were by default more exclusionary than the other groups because they had Gaelic language um, as a requirement. So even within the Scottish community, not everybody might necessarily go, certainly not to the society itself, maybe to an event they organized because they often had um, concerts and things like that. There were also Burns clubs and, and a whole range of other clubs that were considerably more open because Burns was very much a sort of universal symbol almost around the world for humanity and kind of wider things. So that was maybe also open, not just even to Scots, but lots of other people. So it's, it's, it uh, certainly existed, this sort of sub, subset of groups. 
And just to say, that's again, not something that's a characteristic only of this remote diaspora, but there were also Highland societies and Gaelic clubs in, even in Glasgow and in London. So again, in terms of that was kind of my point, shaping Scottish society, it comes very much sort of together wherever people move, um, they, they've shaped um, the society in that sense. Brilliant. Um, next question I've got is uh, Julia Elcock. Um, the Scottish in Canada were particularly known for their financial acumen. Did immigrants have to prove their financial soundness and did the Scots have a bigger influence on finance and banking in the places they went to? I think this this depends a very a very much on on what place we're looking at specifically. So, for instance, in Asia, there were quite a few Scots who were um, very important in founding, for instance, HSBC, um, but then also worked in that. Charles Stuart Addis is one example. He was um, stationed for HSBC effectively in lots of different Asian cities, and he certainly had a lot of influence. And later became also very influential in finance back in England. Actually, he was one of these Scots who were essentially just sojourners. Um, for a kind of employment need uh, or the desire to make wealth, perhaps rather, of some, of some kind anyway, some level. And Asia was one of those destinations where that happened a lot. So you'll find quite a lot of people there. And then in specific countries, Scots did sometimes shape some sort of areas, particularly. So for instance, uh, just as a comparison in New Zealand, they were very important in shaping education. New Zealand essentially has the Scottish four-year honours system, for instance, uh, um, at universities. Um, so it really depends a little bit. What we have to be mindful of and careful with is not to overstate some of this. I think there have been sometimes um, in the past these sort of views that Scots over proportionately shaped certain things. That's tricky to argue because we don't necessarily have a direct comparison or figures that really allow for that assessment, but they certainly were prominent in, in shaping public life. And Canada is a good example, not just maybe for some finance, but also things like whole trade sectors, the fur trade, there were lots of Scots in the fur trade. Um, the first prime minister uh, was a Scot, so you can see how they obviously shaped different branches and different sectors of society. Great. Um well, I say there's more questions to go, so we'll, we'll see how many we can we can fit in the times. So this is one from from Richard. He asks, how many examples of failed emigration have you seen? I have identified a couple of cases of families who emigrated to New Zealand or Australia who were there long enough to have children, but then returned to Scotland after five to seven years. Mm -hmm. Return migration is a really interesting uh, question, which would be um, this would be an example of people choosing to go back. I guess I'd be interested to know why exactly if there's any indicator of why they chose to go back. Um, then they're genuinely, I guess, failed immigrations in terms of people maybe having to go back, which might be a bit of a difference. You know, um, people might choose to go back for family reasons. So I, I would see that slightly differently. But return migration generally, um, we have some better estimates it's now overall of, of figures but it's a field that still I think needs or could do with a lot more research so if any of you are interested in doing PhDs that might just be the topic to pursue because it's difficult sometimes to to identify these people in the first place to follow them back and to understand the reasons for their return as I say I think it makes a difference whether they were essentially pushed back or pulled back, um, for example. Or, well, you have, as I say, in the case of Sojourners, people who actually never set out to permanently settle overseas. They just wanted to go for business to make money and then return. I think we've just got question time for one more question. Um, and then um, perhaps, Tanya, you might want to, to look through the Q&A and chat to yourself to add comments to further questions we don't have time for here. Um, the last one I've got is from Tahitia McCabe. She says, Scotland often has the reputation of being welcoming to immigrants. And do you think the information from so many Scottish immigrants writing back home has helped shape how Scots felt about people coming to Scotland? It's a really interesting question and one I'm kind of trying to work, explore actually a little bit, but the problem maybe is how to measure that uh, in a way that isn't to making kind of too many reading between the line type assumptions. It's tricky, but I certainly think that immigration was something that was very much part of Scottish society in many respects. Now, I don't want to overstate this, but as I say, from the lantern slides to images of the Scottish soldier in sort of building empire or fighting for empire to these ordinary migrants like John Jack, there were a lot of 
sort of stories that were being shared and there is evidence of that. And I do think that certainly has allowed quite a lot of Scots themselves to see themselves part of a kind of a global Scotland. So maybe it could be, I guess, that there's also maybe more contentment to, to have a global Scotland at home. But again, you know, that needs more explanation, uh, exploration, sorry. That's, that's brilliant, thank you. And thank you so much, Tanya. I feel you've given us an excellent paper and, and we've had a slew of questions, uh, which I think shows the level of, of engagement in your talk and, and some really interesting questions and answers there as well. Um, so uh, we'll um, say thank you to you there and we now have a, a 10 minute break.